Hello, and welcome to Bloody Violent History. My name is Tom Ashton, and with my old friend James Jackson, we're going to talk about moments from history that tell us who we are, how we got here, and perhaps where we're heading. And yes, it's often violent and generally quite bloody. And before we proceed with this episode, I would just like to say how good it is, well, I think it is, to have you back, Jamie, after your heart attack and quintuple, or quintuple, bypass. And to think I just thought it was indigestion, Tom. <laughs> I know, all those biscuits, yeah. It I was... know, I'm getting a bit irritated at friends of mine who, uh, who were calling me Little Urn because that's what they thought I'd end up in. Oh no, that's so mean. I know, but anyway, I showed them. <laughs> Little Urn, well, well it's like uh, uh, Ernie, Ernie Wise. <laughs> I know. But I'm back, that's back. the main thing. Well, yeah. I'm delighted you're back in the podcast throne and now I get to eat all the biscuits. I know, it's desperate. I can't, I can't eat anything anymore. It's just steamed vegetables for the rest of my life. Well, I'm just looking over my shoulder to see that one digestive biscuit seems to have already disappeared. <laughs> What's that? Because yeah, well, old habits, they, they was die that, hard. Was that the dog? <laughs> <laughs> OK, on we go. Welcome back to our section on objects from history, 100 Bloody Objects. What have we got today, Jamie? Object number 12, a dart, bombs away, the birth of shock and awe. Bombs have been in use since the 11th century, but our talk today starts in World War I. Bombs as explosive weapons came into the forefront of warfare with the arrival of the aeroplane and shortly thereafter the aerial bomb. Bombs destroy buildings and wound or kill people. They achieve this when they explode by means of impact, heat, fragmentation and overpressure, which is a shockwave. Without descending into a Gilbert and Sullivan litany, they mainly comprise of low explosive, high explosive, thermobaric, the use of oxygen, nuclear fission, used in the Second World War, and nuclear fusion thermonuclear, which is 100 to 1,000 times more powerful than fission. So, Jamie, we start in 1914 at the beginning of the Great War. Things were pretty basic, Tom, as we've mentioned before in Crazy Weapons. It was only a few years, five years, since Blériot had crossed the Channel in a kite plane, and there were still kite planes flying. It was early days, Aerial warfare, whether it was air-to-air or air-to-ground, was totally in its infancy. Uh, In air-to-air warfare, you had people taking blunderbusses up, shotguns, pistols. There was even an incident of two pilots, German and British pilot, firing at each other with flare guns and laughing while they were doing it. Uh, The laughter stopped fairly soon after that when things became deadly and very earnest. In terms of ground attack... The potential for both reconnaissance and bombing was seen early on, and the earliest weapons that were used were, apart from grenades and stones, were flechettes. Those are essentially darts, and those pictures of flechettes are up on the website, and they were very basic darts. They were shards of steel. Some had incendiary potential and were used against zeppelins, for example. But in terms of ground attack, there were instances of uh, people being wounded, of Germans being killed, and the raids started making an impact, and you start getting a specialisation. I mean, flechettes are still used to this day in 2.75-millimetre rockets that are fired by Apache helicopters. They produce a wall of needles, a blizzard of shards that can completely eviscerate anyone in their path, totally vaporise them. Even in the 1940s, there was a type of flechette called the Sleepy Dog, and that was used again in Korea and Vietnam. So they've always been around. But slowly, you see this evolution through the Great War of what you get today, the the idea of close air support, interdiction strike, and strategic bombing. And those fell into defined categories later on, But at this stage, aircraft were multi-purpose, as they are today, what we call swing roll today, because 
things were so basic back then that every aircraft had to do everything. Yes, I suppose they were they were basically they had a new toy and they had to find out what it could do. Yes, and they had to adapt it very quickly. When I say basic, you're talking about the Royal Aircraft Factory B2, a variant of that, with the gunner in front of the propeller in a box because they didn't have synchronised interrupter gear for the machine guns to be able to fire through the propeller. So that gunner, that machine gunner, sat in front of the propeller, which was incredibly dangerous so that's the starting point but as you get through the war you start getting the idea of trench fighters of fighters that can attack ground positions so you get the sop with dolphin the sop with salamander the salamander even though it didn't actually go into service there are only two in france by the end of the war it had an armored front cockpit and those roles were extraordinarily dangerous i mean probably suicidal No one wanted to fly, you know, in a straight line, trying to strafe the enemy that were in zigzag trenches and firing back at them. So the aircraft in the First World War, they were attacking the balloons on the other side of the trenches, which were observing the trenches from the enemy's side, and also they were attacking the troops on the ground. There's an example at Hendon of one of these uh, Sopwith aircraft, Jamie. Yes, if you look at the... Sop with Dolphin, it, it, it looks as though it's the beginnings of a specialised ground attack aircraft. You, you have a stepped wing so that the pilot has a better view downwards. You have those machine guns above the wing and they had to fly in a straight line. It was pretty desperate and no one wanted to have that role. But it, it's certainly the start of what happened later on. And also there's the element of, you know, fighting against another pilot. There's something of the the duel, the glamour, even if it was it was very dangerous, it was sort of honourable. But there was the shooting men up in the trenches and dropping things on them. That was a sort of different form. You know that if you're going to crash land, you're probably going to be shot or bayoneted out of hand. All right. So specialisation starts. We start getting different roles for these early aeroplanes. Yes, and you start getting the concept of strategic bombing as well. And we've talked several times about the concept of total war. And the Germans started to see that attacking Britain, trying to break the morale, trying to undermine what was going on on the Western Front was a key approach. And attacking civilian population centres was quite acceptable. And so you start getting the Zeppelin raids as early as 1915. OK, but just to go back a bit, they'd worked out this idea of, of what, close air support, interdiction and strategic bombing. Was this uh, the three different elements that they'd kind of worked out? It was slowly evolving. I don't think it was done in such a methodical way. It was far more piecemeal than that, in the same way that the dropping the flechettes just evolved. But strategic bombing was very precise, and you had systems that were developed for that. But just for starters, you had to have the range, and you also had to have the payload. The Zeppelin raids start in January 1915 with the first raid on the River Humber. Uh, but winds uh, actually blew that Zeppelin away from that target and they bombed Great Yarmouth, killing four people. And then in May of 1915, there was a raid on the London docks by LZ-38 and seven people were killed. And those raids started increasing in intensity and used greater numbers of these airships, these Zeppelins. Increasing numbers were killed and that no one could have ignored the amount of terror they they created. I mean, by 1917, you had attacks on Liverpool docks, you had attacks on Chatham, and over 100 naval cadets were killed there. So the, the numbers of casualties were growing, and in Germany you started getting this idea of strategic bombing as an effective tool. And in the UK you started getting an appreciation of the terror and the civilian panic that could be created. Yeah, though, I mean, I know that after my uh, grandfather finished his flying training, and we have talked about this uh, before briefly, he was asked by his uh, senior officer if he knew um, how to fly at night uh, because this problem was developing and they were thinking about night fighting 
in the UK, in England, to deal with this problem. And, and his answer was that he wasn't very good at flying in the day and therefore was flying at night any easier. And in fact, he went on to take charge of that particular operation and one of his pilots shot down the first Zeppelin in uh, 1916. And um, another 76 Zeppelins followed. Yeah. Plunging I mean, they were, and they, I mean, they were huge bits of kit. I mean, they took a quarter of a million cow hides to construct. And uh, so the expense downing one Zeppelin for the German war effort was quite considerable. Yeah, 115 were built. So you're talking 25 million cows were probably rustled by people in pickle helm helmets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, a lot of burgers it, all around. Yeah, it was, it was a huge effort. But, but that started the trend. And the Germans then started investing in, in strategic bombers and the Gotha bomber, which started flying over caused huge panic in London and elsewhere. Because this is really the first time uh, that people in this country would see an enemy overhead in the third dimension, in the sky, threatening them and killing them. Yes, um, Britain had never been attacked. There, were, there hadn't been a siege of London in the same way that was a siege of Paris in 1870-71. So the idea of civilian populations being targeted was something completely novel for the British. In fact, if you're walking along the embankment on the uh, north side of the River Thames, near Cleopatra's Needle, I think it is, there's a, a sign on the wall there where some damage to the embankment. It's where one of the bombs from a Zeppelin fell and a number of people were killed there. So it wasn't just a, a minor event. People were being killed. And in Brompton Cemetery, there's the grave of the first guy to actually shoot down a Zeppelin who was Leif Robinson. So the Gotha aeroplane started to sort of overtake the Zeppelin, and we have a raid in May of 1917 by 23 of these bombers, and they flew to bomb London, but they had to turn back over the North Sea and ended up bombing Folkestone, where 95 people were killed. That was and a notorious event and really entered the public consciousness of what could be done. And these bombers carried only 14 60-pound bombs. It wasn't a huge payload, but it was just their very presence that changed the dynamic of warfare. And later that year, September 1917, they attacked Chatham, and 152 people were killed, including 130 uh, naval recruits in a dormitory. So the toll started mounting, and you could see where this trajectory led. And people have heard about the Zeppelin and the Gotha bomber, but not many people have heard of the Zeppelin Starken. Yes, the Starken came in towards the end of the war, and only 13 were commissioned by the end of the war. But some of the raids attributed to Gotha bombers were actually Starken. And, and Starken, a Zeppelin Starken is not a Zeppelin uh, airship. It's actually a, a plane, isn't it? It's a huge plane. It had a wingspan of 138 feet, which is more than a Lancaster. It was a four-engine bomber, had a forward propeller and a back propeller. So <laughs> it, it was a push-me-pull-you plane. And yeah, with an unfortunate engineer sitting between the engine and the, on the wing. Yes, it had a crew. Side. Yes, it had a crew of about nine to ten people. So it was it was a vast beast, this complete behemoth flying over London, and it could carry about four thousand pounds of bombs. And it bombed the Royal Hospital Chelsea. It bombed St Pancras Station. It, it was a fearsome beast, which is quite ironic, given that. By the Second World War, the Germans didn't have a four-engine bomber, so they, they had forgotten the art of strategic bombing, and it was the Brits and the Americans who picked that particular baton up and ran with it. Yeah, that's interesting, because they were often so good at seeing other people like us come up with something, like, for instance, using the machine gun before the First World War, and yet on this occasion they, they missed it completely. B because their military strategy changed and they came up with combined arms operations and the concept of Blitzkrieg. Yeah. So they believed in lightning war and a quick victory. So they never really saw the need for then hitting industrial centres sort of or cities. They... Yes, they, they thought they'd, they'd win quickly. And, and, and so, again, their strategy moved ahead and it wasn't the right one, ultimately. Yeah, well, they damn nearly did until, yes. you know, we, we um, had the Battle of Britain. Yes, and then ground them into the dust with strategic bombing. That'll teach them. Right, but well, before we move on 
to the interwar years, I just want to mention a little family tale of my great-grandfather, Hotham, who was a scientist at the Munitions Investigation Department, MID, in Isha, in the war. And in 1917, we have a rather nice photograph, which I'll stick on the Instagram, of him in his workshop inventing bombs for the front. And after the war, when he was retired or he gave it up, he was given a couple of bombs as lamps, which were presented to him as a thank you. And they were taken back to the family pad Dalton and installed in one of the great aunt bedrooms where they remained for many years, wired up and working in the corner until it was noticed that there was a strange liquid leaking out of the base of one of the lamps. And what they'd failed to do is actually remove the explosives <laughs> from, the, <laughs> from these bombs. And so I imagine they were taken away and drained of their explosives and then put back on the shelf. Um, my cousin John apparently still has one, but he can't find it at the moment. It's probably ticking away in the attic. Do you think there were any did the earth move for you moments? <laughs> great aunts. The <laughs> earth doesn't move for great aunts. Yeah, they, they wouldn't have any of that nonsense. <laughs> okay, post-war. What happened after the war ended? I think there was a mood of never again. And the concept of strategic bombing fitted very well into that approach because people like your grandfather, Bomber Harris, had flown over Passchendaele and the Somme, had seen the trenches, had seen the misery and the death and the squandering of hundreds of thousands of lives. And there was this push that was carried on by air strategists between the wars, that air power is the way of getting around that, that it was much better to hit the enemy in his home base. They were looking for a, a different approach. They were looking approach. for a much better approach, the idea that you could break the will and the morale of the enemy and avoid that carnage of young men being slaughtered on the, on the front. So it came from a place of not wanting to deploy troops in the field. It fitted into this post-war concept of the indirect approach, which, again, we've talked about, of Basil Littleheart, of, of not deploying men to the continent. So there was this idea of influencing events without having actually to put boots on the ground. And meanwhile, Hitler and his cohorts believed that they had been defeated by a blockade and betrayal. Yes, and again, that they hadn't been defeated in the field. So in a way, they came away from it with a different idea, uh, but, but that it was the home front that had killed them, that it was starvation of their populations and that it was the politicians that had let everyone and down. Been stabbed in the back. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, But the, the Brits and, and the Americans were certainly moving in that direction of saying, let's use air power. And certainly the effect of these, you know, in relative terms, quite minor raids on London compared to what happened in the next war, this terror inflicted by the Germans on Britain really struck home. It made a big effect on both the people devising strategy and the population as a whole. Totally. If you had seen the terror at the time and the panic that ensued from bombers coming over, the fact that the statue of Prince Albert and the Albert Memorial had its gold leaf painted black so it wouldn't reflect so that the Gotha bombers or the Zeppelins wouldn't spot it and use it as an aiming point. You know, these were all things that fed into the press and the public imagination. And the concept came about, if you create that terror, then why not have more bombs and create more terror? So you can see that equation, you can see that dynamic at work. So they're, they're really getting to the point where everything is a legitimate target and all people are legitimate targets. Well, even women worked in aircraft factories during the Great War, so everyone became a legitimate target. And if you're trying to break the will of the opposition, the will of the enemy, then you have to break the population's will also. After the war, and so much money being spent on fighting in the Great War that everything was going to be done on a, a shoestring, the policing of the colonies gradually evolved from this use of aircraft rather than men on the ground because it was seen to be uh, more economic, cheaper than boots on the ground. So in 1920, there were problems in Somaliland. 
There were some. There was the mad mullah himself, Abdullah Hassan, who led this revolt among the dervishes. The Brits went in, and they went in pretty hard, and it was a three-week campaign. There were 12 DH-9 de Havilland planes, biplanes. They were adapted to attack the forts, drop bombs on the three main resistance forts, and they did it very effectively. Uh, it was only a camel that got in the way of the blast of a bomb that saved Hassan himself, saved the mad mullah. But all his men basically scarpered into the hills because they had never seen aircraft before. So the effects of aircraft, this group of a dozen aircraft, could be seen very quickly. And aerial bombing, you know, sending fighters and bombers abroad, became a key British policy in terms of colonial policing and running the empire. Yeah, I remember uh, reading in Henry Probert's book the bit about when they had problems in Iraq, for instance, with uh, tribes up in the hills, uh, in villages. In previous encounters, they would send the army, and by the time the army got there, the problem and the tribesmen had, had gone away, had headed into the hills, further into the hills. And so they came up with this idea of the air pin, which is basically they'd send some airplanes up who would fly around the village where the problem was, dropping a notice to the occupants and the, and the rebels below saying don't move, if you do move, you'll be bombed or shot. And then the army would come trudging up the hill and arrest them. That was the, the idea, and it seemed to work quite well. And it's fascinating that the RAF took control of the campaign in Iraq when this revolt blew up along the Euphrates, and the army didn't like it at all. But it became essentially an air campaign, and I think your grandfather was out there. This was late 1920s. Yes, he was. Uh, in, in fact, he, he wrote after the campaign about how they dealt with this problem. I'll just read a little bit of what he wrote. It immediately struck me that there was potentially the most powerful part of the Air Force in Iraq, employed on virtually civil duties and making no serious contribution to our very tenuous military strength in that part of a very disturbed world. I told Sir John Salmon of my feelings and I said I could convert the squadron's aircraft into the most useful bombers in the country. He gave me the green light. We had no equipment immediately available and apart from the prospect of at least a year's argument with the Air Ministry over this additional role, it would take at least three or four months to get any equipment out by sea. The major requirements were bomb racks or rails, which were not readily available and were difficult to manufacture out of materials sufficiently strong and light enough not to absorb the total flyable lift-off weight of the aircraft. However, with the aid of a brilliant technical warrant officer, Wilkinson, and a WD workshop, we worried out some roughly finished but serviceable rails from high-grade sheet steel. We fitted them up with racks for 20, 50 and 100 pound bombs and incendiary containers, and by sawing an unauthorised hole in the nose of the aircraft, we had a magnificent, brackets prone, bomb aiming position into which we also fitted a homemade trigger release gear operated by a length of shock absorber. With this equipment, we could not only bomb far more accurately, but were able to make much heavier attacks than the DH-9As or Bristols could produce. And I think he's referring to the fact that they were flying Vickers Vernons in this particular operation. So you can see where Bomber was beginning to get his ideas for aerial bombing from, from that colonial experience. It was so Heath Robinson, there was no real science involved, but people were beginning to work it out through direct operational experience in the field. Yeah, it was practical, wasn't it? It, it was practical, and, and again, you saw that later on in places like Waziristan and Afghanistan, where in the 1930s that was the main RAF focus of attention because, again, there was a need to suppress rebellion. There was a friction and a tension between the army and the air force, with the air force taking a role in, in leading the counterinsurgency. Yeah, and the army never really, or still at this stage, not really believing that the air force was a separate force. 
Yes, and we'll talk about this later on, and certainly in the United States. The United States Air Force didn't become independent until after the Second World War. But you can see these experiences, the experiences of the Great War, the experiences of colonial war, was pushing the, the sort of argument in favour of independent air forces and certainly the use of air power. And that's when you start getting these air strategists coming forward, promoting the idea of air power, that air power alone could do it. So we have these colonial wars, small wars, and from this and the experience in the First World War, a number of air strategy profits evolve. And they crystallised very much the experiences in the interwar years and pushed the agenda of independent air forces. You had people like Brigadier General Billy Mitchell, William Mitchell, the father of modern US air power. He was very much promoting air power as a means of creating an independent air force, an autonomous air force, because at that stage and for years to come, it would be controlled by the US Army. He became an adjutant chief of the air service, the air branch of the army. But he ended up being court-martialed for insubordination because of his desire to create an independent air force. He saw it as the key defense of America, and he saw air power as the main threat to the United States. So he drove this agenda, and Roosevelt saw his views as pernicious when he started claiming that bombers should be used to knock out ships, for example, knock out enemy warships and tried to promote aircraft carriers so he was very controversial in the united states and again there was that friction between the army and the air arm and then we have hugh trenchard the father of the royal air force which was created in the first world war yes and hugh trenchard had the luck unlike billy mitchell of being chief of an independent air force by the end of the First World War. So he had that ability to promote air power, knowing that he was already in charge of an independent service. His belief was that you could break the morale of the enemy through air power. He had seen what had happened in the Great War. He had seen what the German bombers had done. And he said, this is the means. If you hit the centres of industry, the centres of power in enemy territory, essentially Germany then you are going to defeat the enemy. You're going to break their morale. And so he was a huge advocate of that and was key to the development of the air bombing strategy of the Second World War. On the 10th of November 1932, Stanley Baldwin said, I think it is well also for the man in the street to realise that there is no power on earth that can protect him from being bombed. Whatever people may tell him, the bomber will always get through. The only defence is an offence, which means that you have to kill more women and children more quickly than the enemy if you want to save yourselves. If the conscience of the young man should ever come to feel, with regard to this one instrument, bombing, that it is evil and should go, the thing will be done. But if they do not feel like that, well, as I say, the future is in their hands. But when the next war comes and European civilization is wiped out, as it will be, and by no force more than that force, then do not let them lay blame on the old men. Let them remember that they principally, or they alone, are responsible for the terrors that have fallen upon the earth. And they had this idea that the bomber will always get through. There was that pervasive belief, but then... There were enough Gota bombers shot down in the First World War to, to, to understand that if you had a strong fighter element against you, the bomber was not always going to get through. Tell that to the US 8th Air Force crews who were shot down over Schweinfurt in August and October 1943. They had an attrition rate of 19 to 25% in those raids. It was horrific. So the bomber didn't always get through, but it could still make a huge impact. And that's what Trenchard was saying. He essentially believed that you could overcome navigation problems, night flying problems, and that as technology developed, so the power of the bomber, the power of air strength would prevail. And another early prophet for the use of air power was Guilio Douai. 
the Italian, and he was really a huge thinker on the subject, whereas Hugh Trenchard had, I suppose, that British restraint and reservation of attacking civilian population centres. Douay had no such qualms. He believed that you know, this was total war, everyone was involved, and you had to break the morale of the enemy. So whereas Trenchard was saying hit industry, hit infrastructure, Douay was saying area bomb cities. And in a way, Douay was right because the technology had not caught up by the time of the Second World War to do anything other than area bombing. World War II arrives in 1939. And yet before the 22nd of March 1945, the Western Allies had no way of striking at Germany itself except from the air. That's right. It was Patton's forces that first crossed the Rhine in March 1945, followed a day later by Montgomery's forces. And although the aerial bombing campaign during the Second World War is a controversial subject, anyone who argues against it has to come up with an alternative because for five and a half years, we could not hit Germany directly. And so aerial bombing became our means of striking Germany, our second front, our way of aiding the Soviets on the Eastern Front who were bleeding out in order to destroy the Germans. And so US 8th Air Force and RAF Bomber Command became critical initially to the survival of Britain during the Second World War, but then to taking the offensive to the enemy. Yes, and that was dehousing the enemy workers, undermining their morale, and they extracted upwards of a million soldiers or civil authorities from the Eastern Front to back to Germany, where they were manning anti-aircraft guns and uh, dealing with the bombing raids in Germany. It had a massive effect on Germany's ability to stave off the advance of the Soviets during the latter stages of the war, certainly after the fall of Stalingrad in early 1943. And, and all the fighters as well. All the German fighters had to be pulled back from the east to defend the, the fatherland. Indeed. If you look at the resources that was, were invested in Germany, not only to counter RAF and American bombers, the ten to 20,000 dual-use 88mm guns that were placed in Germany that could have hit tanks on the Eastern Front or could have been sent to the west to fight the advance of the Allied forces after the Normandy invasion, you can see the, the impact that that would have had on the war effort. You've mentioned the million people involved in uh, firefighting, in civil defence, in manning anti-aircraft batteries, in rebuilding Germany and the cities that were hit, in trying to move industry around and in putting industry underground. This was a huge problem for Albert Speer and the Nazis. And you cannot take that away from Bomber Command. They had a very significant impact on Germany's ability to fight. And I think it was Goebbels, wasn't it, who said that um, a few more raids like the one in Hamburg, something like six or seven, and that would be it. They'd be done. And even during the Battle of the Bulge, there was talk by Sepp Dietrich and his fellow commanders of a massive impact on German morale at the front, knowing that German cities were being bombed, that German workers, their families were being moved out of cities. And what about more specific targets? If you look at RF bomber raids on Pinamunda, where the V2 and V1 were being developed and tested, the destruction foisted on the east compound there ensured that V2 rocket production had to be moved to Poland. If you look at the US 8th Air Force raid on the Rukan Dam, the raids that were conducted by B-17s and B-24s, Yes, one of the raids might have dropped just over 700 bombs and 600 of them missed, but the actual damage and the impact on German morale forced the Germans not only to send their heavy water stocks, their nuclear heavy water stocks, to Germany, but the actual development of that technology, the production of heavy water, was then sent down to northern Italy. So again, the disruption was huge. And we talked about that a little bit in another podcast, The Heroes of Telemark. And the SOE at that point really had decided it was just too difficult to send agents in to deal with that. It had to be done by bombing. 
you can't hit a target twice. You're, you're asking for trouble. And the Germans were aware that it was a target. I mean, they'd sent thousands of soldiers out to hunt those SOE saboteurs first time round. So the chances of getting back in was, was minimal. There was a discussion between Solly Zuckerman and the OSS about enemy objectives. There was always this tension about which targets to hit, and the science and the targeting was evolving. Things had come a long way since your grandpa had adapted his aircraft out in Iraq in the early 1920s. War is a great crucible for change and development. If you think that RF Bomber Command at the start of the war was dropping bombs five miles from their target, by the end of the war, with pathfinders, with onboard radar, things were becoming, and beam technology, things were becoming far more precise. At the beginning of the war, it really did become the key element of British strategy to stay in the war. It did, and Bomber Harris wanted, I think, up to 6,000 bombers. He never got that many, but it consumed a vast proportion of Britain's war effort. I mean, some people calculate it was almost 50% of our war expenditure. It was very expensive, and the crews were very difficult to find the quality of people. They were the most technically proficient young men in Britain at the time. If you think of the pilots, navigators, the engineers, it, it, it consumed a huge part of Britain's war effort. Yeah, I didn't realise that uh, until recently that the people on, these, on the Lancaster bombers, say the engineer, was probably as proficient a pilot almost as the pilot himself. They all doubled up and more so. On their, on their ability to navigate, to fire, to bomb aim, and so on. So they really, they were highly skilled throughout all the trades. And their losses were catastrophic, and that's the other thing to remember. It was a very high attrition rate, very high numbers of casualties, and, and that's what lends it such pathos. I mean, we yeah. remember the impact that they had on cities in Germany, but on the crews of the RAF and the US Air Force as well, it was immense. Well, the, R, um, the RAF Bomber Command lost 44% of their uh, crews killed. And eventually we come to the discussion about Dresden, which we're not going to go into detail here. It's just to say that it was bombed by Bomber Command, by the RAF and by the uh, US Air Force in the day. I mean, we're not blind to the horror of Dresden, even if I state the fact that it was just one of many raids on Germany and Europe in that relentless war of attrition over more than five years. I mean, one of my favourite books is Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. Vonnegut was a prisoner of war in Dresden and survived the attack because he was detained in a meat locker during the raid hence Slaughterhouse Five. It's a brilliantly funny and moving and strange book, the only way, in fact, that he could manage to write about his experience. It's a plea in part against the violent nature of man. Billy Pilgrim, with a tip of the hat to John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, is the central character. When something especially appalling, horrific occurs, he's left almost speechless except for these three words. So it goes. That is the sign-off that we've adopted for this show. So it goes. I think the thing with Dresden is that hindsight is always a great thing. At the time, it was another target. We had been asked to take pressure off the Russians who were about to mount their offensive. The casualty figures of civilian population in Dresden shifts around but has now stabilised the estimate is about 20,000, whereas for years people were claiming 100,000 people were killed. And, and Goebbels Dresden. jumped on that figure as well, didn't he, when it came out in the, in the Western Allies press initially. He added a zero to the figure of 25,000. He was always going to. But if you look at the casualties of, say, Tokyo, where 100,000 people were killed in the fire raids over there, you, that sort of bombing is always going to create tragedy and horror. And, of course, Dresden was such a cultural centre, so it was dreadful. But from the point of view of the air chiefs and politicians in London, it was just another target at the time, and it was only later when criticism started that the politicians ran for cover. Uh, Bomber Harris had the unfortunate position of never running for cover and never apologising. 
And that's one of the reasons that Dresden is controversial. Here is Sir Arthur Harris, at 85 and still firing on all cylinders, speaking at the Bomber Command Association about the strategic bomber offensive. From the start, he is referring to the Nazi munitions minister, Albert Speer. His next statement that might be of interest to you was that he reckoned as minister of uh, armament, which he'd then become, that by the end of 1943, when we were really getting going with about a quarter of the force we'd asked for, and the Americans had really got going with their Mustang uh, escort fighters, that we had already deprived the German armies on the Russian front by bomb damage to industry of 10,000 of their bigger caliber guns and 6,000 of their heaviest and medium heavy tanks. Well, that was quite a subscription towards the war, all done by the strategic bomber. But he goes much further than that. And I tell you, he made that remark about the bomber strategic offensive being the greatest lost battle of all for Germany. And he goes on to explain why. The 8.8 centimeter dual purpose anti-aircraft and anti-tank gun was probably the most useful gun that the Germans possessed. And as the armament, for instance, of their Tiger and Panther tanks, it was the only gun, mobile gun, capable of competing with the very heavy frontal armament of the Russian tanks. No less than 20,000 of those guns had to be taken away from the German armies on all their fronts, kept away from them, and scattered all over Germany because of the unpredictability of where the strategic bombers were going to strike next. Speer says that that reduced the anti-tank ability of the German forces on all their fronts by half. Well, when you realize that no army on either side ever advanced a yard without their armored spearhead first busting a way through the defense. You can realize what it meant when the bombers, the strategic bombers, cut their anti-tank defenses by half. He goes on to say that uh, that requirement of being prepared to defend every German city and every German vital factory against the possibility and the unpredicted probability of bombing of any one of those particular places meant the stationing all over Germany of hundreds of thousands of men who should have been in the forces. Field Marshal Erhard Milch, who commanded the German anti-aircraft defenses, said he had 900,000 fit, he stressed the words fit, men in his anti-aircraft command alone. When he says fit, he means they were fit to have been up in the front line of the German armies on the various fronts and not kicking their heels around Germany, waiting for the strategic bombers and wondering where they were going to strike next. Well. If you know of any individual army on the Allied side, which throughout the war deprived the German armies of well over a million men and half their anti-tank abilities, I would personally be very obliged for the information. <laughs> OK, Jamie, let's get into a little bit of the detail about the kit and what was going on. Obviously, uh, in the Spanish Civil War and at the beginning of the war in the Blitzkrieg, we had the Stuka. 
Yes, I mean, the Germans were at the cutting edge of close air support, combined arms operations. And as we said earlier, they, they, they hadn't developed the strategic bombing concept and didn't have a four-engine bomber. So it couldn't hit uh, Soviet industry, for example, behind the Urals. But what they did do, they had superb science. And so they really invented the world's first guided bomb, glide bomb, the Fritz X. Yeah, it was a 3,000-pound bomb. Is that our name for it, Fritz X? No, I think that... Sounds like an insult. (laughs) Anyway, um, and the Fritz X did have uh, quite an impact, so to speak. Oh, dear. Bomb puns. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The the Fritz X uh, did actually make a splash (laughs) to use another... Ka-ching, number two. (laughs) Come on, I want a third one. (laughs) Fritz Fritz X frazzled the enemy. (laughs) Anyway, the Fritz X appeared, made a splash, had an impact. I'll try and think of another bomb pun later on. And it did significant amount of damage. What stopped it being more effective was that the Germans being pushed back from the coast, whether it was in Italy or after the Normandy invasion. So they didn't have air superiority. And uh, even as Trenchard pointed out, between the wars, air superiority was the key to winning battles in the future. So when it was operational uh, after 1943, the the Fritz X did actually contribute significantly. It it managed to sink the Italian battleship Roma after the Italians surrendered to the Allies. And the Roma was hit as it steamed for Tunisia from Italy in September 1943. And capsized and 1,300 men on board died. It also hit two Allied ships during the landings at Salerno in September 1943. Uh, HMS Uganda, a light cruiser, was hit. The USS Savannah, uh, an American cruiser, was hit. And quite a significant number of sailors were killed on that. But the ship survived and was eventually towed back to the United States for repair. The Fritz X had a guidance system which was radio controlled it had a range of three miles it was highly effective you know had the germans like their other specialist weapons um stayed in the game stayed in the war it would have had even more effect then we come on to our favorite inventor and and scientist barnes wallace yes originally based at brooklands uh, where you can see some of his bombs and his inventions to this day. Uh, he worked for Vickers, ended up being employed by the British government and transformed bomb technology uh, for Britain during the Second World War. He came up with many great inventions, including the earthquake bomb. And there were two versions of those. There was the tall boy and the grand slam, and they did significant damage to German interests and German ships uh, during the Second World War. Uh, the greatest casualty, the greatest victim, I think, of the tall boy was really the Tirpitz. In September 1944, RAF Lancasters carried this 12,000-pound bomb and, and dropped it on the German battleship. The Germans, where they had moored it up in Norway, thought that a sand bank would stop the Tirpitz uh, capsizing, but the earthquake bomb, which burrowed its way in, the tall boy, managed to create such huge craters in the sandbank and demolish large parts of it that when three tall boys actually hit the turpits, the ship eventually uh, capsized. I mean, the magazines blew up and it, it turned turtle and, and a lot of men were killed. So that was a huge score for Barnes Wallace's bomb. Later on, the Grand Slam and the tall boy did huge damage to German dockyards, to viaducts, to industry, to U-boat pens and bunkers. It it was a significant contribution to the war effort later on in the Second World War. I mean, the the Grand Slam, the the really big one, uh, the Lancaster bomber itself had to be specially adapted to carry it. 22,000 pound bomb, if you think that an average large bomb carried by a, a Lancaster's 500 pounds, a standard large bomb. 22,000 pound bomb is just a, a monster. And they were the precursors to these sort of deep 
earth penetrator munitions that you get today, the bunker busting bombs of today. Barnes Wallace really invented that genre of weapon, you know, showed the way of what could be done. And finally, his most famous invention, the bouncing bomb. I've actually held the bouncing bomb. I mean, obviously not picking it up. <laughs> all, all several thousand pounds of it. Yes, I didn't do that. But I did feel it and, and hold the edges of it. And it was very moving. It, it was a... Is it like a sort of big oil drum? Yes. It's a crossbeam and a dustbin and an oil drum, I guess. Yeah. This was an inert one that was dropped during practice runs. And it's at, at Brooklyn's today. And it's very moving to, to hold it and know the, what was invested in that and the sacrifice that was made in dropping uh, the live versions of it and the raid that took place in 1943. 19 Lancasters, three waves that they went in to hit the Ruhr dams and ended up destroying the Myrna and the Eder dams. That was with the loss of eight aircraft and 53 crew killed and three captured. So it was a hell of a price for an incredible raid. And the two moments that really struck me, one was the bomb that fell out of the Lancaster Bay in the hangar at Scampton, which could have blown everyone to pieces. And the other was the bomber that flew so low because of the weight and the shape and the lack of aerodynamics of the bomb that it hit the waves and the waves actually ripped the bomb from off the undercarriage. So those are the two moments that really strike me. It was an extraordinary moment. And again, it just showed how technology had moved on, how specialist bombs were being created, and not just the area bombing that had created that dynamic between air blast and incendiaries and what you should use in the mix. You know, this was really specific scientific development that was going into ordnance but combined with incredible piloting ability, where they flew almost uh, uh, at 60 feet and, and at incredibly low uh, altitudes. Phen phenomenal feats. And, of course, we all know about the deaths and attrition of bomber crews and so many of those crews that took part in the raid on the dams were killed in later operations, including Guy Gibson himself. And we think of napalm as a weapon of the Vietnam War, but in fact the Americans were using it in 1944. It certainly was used during the Second World War. It was dropped on Berlin in '44. It was also being used out in the Pacific Theatre as well. It was employed at Okinawa, Iwo Jima. It was a very good weapon using jellified petrol uh, to flush out the Japanese to create a wide area effect to take the oxygen out of the air and to burn people out of their bunkers. And so napalm became a very widely used weapon out there. You know, it wasn't widely used in Germany, but it certainly evolved into becoming a key weapon. And so by the time of the Vietnam War, you're getting almost 400,000 tonnes being dropped in Vietnam. It was also used in the Korean War, but on a much smaller scale. But it started with the Second World War. And lastly, of course, nuclear. We have endless controversy about uh, bombing in the Second World War, but what ended the war was a nuclear bomb. And I suspect that the casualties, both among the Japanese population and armed forces, and certainly among the American armed forces, would have been horrific and on a mass scale have those bombs not been dropped so that always has to be put into the mix put into the equation and of course it's really the culmination of an air strategy that suggested that total war meant total war that your civilian populations were there but there's no doubt that those two bombs forced the japanese to surrender they could not hold out against that kind of superior air power do you think they would have dropped one on Berlin? That's a really tricky one to say, but it's perfectly possible had the Germans held out. I don't see that by the end of the war that the Allies were ever going to take the sort of casualties that the Soviets were capable or willing to take. 
you know, you could see in the policies of certainly of people in Montgomery the caution involved in sending troops forward. I mean, we have been fighting for over five years. So I, I can certainly see a situation in which we would have done that had the Nazis held out. And we or, said, or perhaps if they'd gone to their final redoubt. I was going to say they might well have dropped one in, in Bavaria somewhere had there been a problem, although the Bavarian mountains are, are, are not uh, highly densely populated, and so it might have been difficult to find a, a worthwhile target. Adolf, if he was sitting there in his bunker, anyway. Yes, he would have been a shadow of his former self. Oh, no. OK. <laughs> World War II comes to an end, and then it's almost straight in where we're into the Cold War, the post-war period, and the Cold War deterrence. Yes, and the assets were very much World War II in the initial stages of the Cold War. So strategic bombers became nuclear bombers, and that was where the deterrent rested for quite a long while until missiles took over, Polaris, Poseidon, Trident, and the nuclear deterrent sort of moved onto ballistic missile submarines. I mean, even Britain had three types of nuclear bombers back in the 50s and going into the 60s. There was the Vulcan, the Valiant, the Victor. They were adapted to such things as air refueling tankers, and the Vulcan even had a conventional bombing role uh, during the Falklands War. So they had quite a long lifespan in different capacities and different roles. And... Even today, those legacy aircraft, such as the B-52 and the Tupelo of 95 Bear, are still flying, are still operational. There are almost 60 B-52 bombers, big, ugly, fat fuckers, as they're known as, in Air Force circles. We'll have to beep that out for the the school's edition of this podcast. (laughs) But those aircraft are still flying because they're incredibly useful. You're talking about a bomber in the B-52 that has a range of over 8,000 miles unrefueled after taking off. It can carry up to 70,000 pounds of ordnance. During the Vietnam War, it had an incredible role. I mean, not always successful, but it was certainly used in Operation Rolling Thunder, bombing Viet Cong targets in South Vietnam. Often the Viet Cong had left the area in Operation Linebacker raids later on, bombing Hanoi and other targets in North Vietnam, those B-52 bombers could carry 108 500-pound bombs, 24 of them on wing racks. So they were very potent, very powerful. And you can see what they carry today. They're still operational. They can carry joint air-to-surface standoff missiles, JASM cruise missiles. They can carry massive ordnance penetrator weapons, the inheritors of Barnes-Wallace's earthquake bombs. Uh, They can destroy and undermine bunkers deep within mountains. And yes, it probably was designed to hit Iranian nuclear weapons development. So... These bombers still have a role. You look at the Tupelo 95, the bear, the famous bear. I mean, this is a bomber, again, like the B-52, came into service in the early 1950s, early to mid-1950s, and will still be flying in the middle of the century. So both the B-52 and the Tupelo of TU-95 will have a lifespan of about 100 years. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah, and it's amazing to think that the design of the turboprop engine on the Tupolev was designed by a a German prisoner of war captured in 43 I think it was in uh, by the Russians taken to Russia and he helped uh, his name was Ferdinand Branner and he helped Kuznetsov design the turboprop engine which they're still using today with with modifications and he was behind the development of the largest turboprop engine ever built and what the russians had done was simply take the entire stock the manufacturing facilities and all the engineers and scientists from yunkers and transport them to the soviet union and they got a lot of bang for their buck out of it and today you'll see raf typhoon aircraft still intercepting bare bombers encroaching on uk airspace so these legacy aircraft have a long reach, and that is air power 
reaching across the century. And now in the modern day, we have shock and awe, we have precision guided weapons. Yes, and if you look at the Falklands War back in 82, when we used that Vulcan bomber, today we would simply fire Tomahawk missiles that could go straight through the window of the Argentine Defence Ministry a thousand miles off. So, And they, well, they'd be fired from a submarine? They'd be fired yeah. from a submarine. But uh, weapons such as JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munitions, which basically turn dumb bombs into smart bombs are the answer, as are cruise missiles. And those warheads keep developing. You know, the British have a warhead called Broach that is a tandem warhead, can send a plasma stream through, and the warhead behind it will then go off. And so, sorry, so it's, it, it burns a hole through first, and then the warhead just comes in afterwards and explodes. Is that how it Yes, works? it's a yeah. tandem warhead. So you can get through dozens of feet of concrete. So precision devastation, all these things are improving. And that is truly shock and awe. And the Americans now have a policy called parallel targeting, where you're not going to take days to knock out a target. It's going to be done in the first couple of hours, because you're getting cruise missiles, aircraft, drones, that are all going to be able to travel at hypersonic speeds. A Rolls Royce of an engine that can fly at Mach 3 without afterburner things have moved on dramatically and will keep evolving. But we talked about the birth of shock and awe in 1914, and this is where it's come to today. So it's a bit of a full circle. I mean, the aircraft are now multi-role, like they were at the beginning of the First World War. Yes, we've gone through the sort of differences between close air support, interdictor strike, strategic bombers, but so often now the aircraft are swing roll and can do all those sorts of functions. You look at close air support aircraft such as the Harrier and A-10, Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, and those are going to be replaced by the F-35 Lightning that will also be a fighter, which will also be an interdictor strike aircraft. So And a bomber. And a bomber. Yeah. So because all these aircraft can carry standoff missiles now that have several hundred miles range. So the dream of shock and awe devised between the wars has probably become a reality today. Maybe the profits of air power have been proved right. Well, you know, we don't like to leave you without a postscript. So, P.S., Jamie, what are we going to have? Our P.S. really concerns both the controversy and sacrifice surrounding the bombing campaign of the Second World War, because it can't go unnoticed that the statue to your grandfather, Sir Arthur Bomber Harris, was only put up in 1992, that the national memorial to the bomber crews killed during World War II was only erected in 2012. That's 67 years after the end of the Second World War. And yet their sacrifice was dramatic. They lost 55,000. That's 44% of the total crew numbers during the Second World War. The only armed service during World War II that had higher numbers of casualties was really the, the German U-boat service, and they lost 28,000 men, and that was about 75% of their total manpower. So that level of sacrifice of young men who were extraordinarily highly trained, technically proficient, went unrecognised for decades after the end of hostilities. It's also worth mentioning that if anyone visits that memorial or actually ponders on the casualties among bomber crews during the Second World War, that they take into consideration that so many of these young men died in horrendous circumstances. They were not quick or easy deaths, and so many of them went down on aircraft that were in flames and took a long time to reach the ground, and that is also something worth reflecting upon. It's probably right, and a more eloquent tribute to these men, that we really play out with the sound of a cockpit recording taken from a Lancaster bomber on a mission to bomb Germany.
so it goes. My name is Tom Ashton. His name is James Jackson. You can view images relating to each podcast on our Bloody Violent History Instagram account and on our website, bloodyviolenthistory.com. Please subscribe, it's free, to our podcast on the app you use and to our mailing list via our website. This is very important as it boosts our rankings in the podcast charts. Thank you and good luck.